What is known as the feminist movement, or the modern feminist movement, began approximately in the 1840s, almost two centuries ago. And it came to address the long history of inequality between men and women. In truth, it's really hard to identify when it actually began because this issue has, addressed, has been plaguing the human race from the beginning of time, as soon as there were men and women, you can imagine. But generally speaking, it's understood that over many, many years, there was a patriarchal society with men dominating and controlling in politics, financially, socially, at home, and in many cases, some even justified it, that it was a biological thing. That's what God wanted, that men be dominant over women. And with many different sources cited, including biblical ones. But in truth, is that the truth? That's the real question. And what is the response? The fact is, there's no doubt that there has been an inequality and there's no doubt that the feminist movement, or whatever you want to call it, and its four waves, as known as four waves of the movement, did do some correction in regard to financial equality, political equality. But the big question is, what does it do to the woman and to the man? Are we clear today about our identities? Male identity, masculine identity, feminine identity? In the 60s, Betty Friedan wrote the book, The Feminine Mystique. So is there something uniquely different about a man and a woman and just happens to be, since men are biologically stronger, they dominate it. And what we have to do is just equal the scales. Or the true feminism would be rising to the occasion and truly becoming a woman the way a woman should be and a man the way a man should be. Is the distortion only... On one end, only for the women and not for the men. Just as your body needs exercise, nourishment, hygiene, so too does your soul. We have a series of programs called Soul Gym. It's free. Sign up for it in the description below. What I'm going to try to make a case for is that we have a distortion across the board. And the solution is not, as many women say, is not just that women should be able to play equally in a man's playing field, by man's laws, in other words, since you're getting paid a certain amount, I want to get that, pay, that amount. Since you have able to assume a certain political position, I want to be able to assume that position. Since you can be a CEO of a company as a male, I as a woman want to be a, a CEO. That has, is one side of it. But is that ultimately cosmetic and superficial? And what about the fundamental elements of embracing and reclaiming are very masculinity and very femininity. And in that context, yes, you can say sometimes the focus on the externals, as important as it may be, can undermine the focus on the internals, which is what we will be addressing. I've heard this from quite a few women that have told me that though I respect the feminist movement and I respect feminists, but in many ways I don't feel like a woman under their rules. They're trying to be like men. And it just makes me feel more inferior. Because why should we be like men? Yes, we should have equal rights. We should be treated equally. We should not be abused. We should not be in any way controlled or dominated over, especially in an unhealthy way. But I want to be a woman. I don't want to be a man. Now, of course, this touches upon gender issues altogether and gender identity. So let's address it and I like to address it from the root. What really is a man and what is a woman? Now we know they're more similar than they're different. Both human beings, both function essentially the same way with biological, physiological, and psychological, emotional differences as well. And those differences are critical. They're not superficial either. So how do you even begin to address it? For most of us, the perception of a man or a woman is what we pick up at home, what we saw in our mothers, our grandmothers, or grandfathers and fathers, or what society tells us, or what we learn in school. How do we even know that's accurate? And then what are we doing? Copying someone else's model of what a male or female is? And is that that's called freedom? Is that called liberation? 
So the real question is, what defines a man and what defines a woman? Because without that, everything else can be a distortion. If you decided that a carpenter, for example, is someone that, that um, is, 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 creates glass, uh, glass objects, then he'll never be a real carpenter. You have to first define what is the very identity of something and then say, now, how do we live up to it? Including the diversity, because obviously no one, two women are alike, like no two men are alike. No two people are alike. We all have differences. But what are the fundamentals of what we call a feminine personality and the fundamentals of a masculine personality? So before we get into that, let me just say one important statement, that there's also overlap. When you talk about the feminine archetype and the masculine archetype, both men have both elements and, bo and women have both elements. What makes a woman a woman and a man a man is the dominant gene, so to speak. So that's also vital. It's not mutually exclusive. And that's why you'll find that some women have more masculine traits and some men have more feminine traits. So let's talk about it from the mystical point of view. I find that to be the purest place to begin with because it's not touched by politics and by social mores or by people's opinions. It, it has a certain pristine element to it because it's talking about energy, feminine energy and masculine energy. And the way the mystics put it, and paraphrasing it somewhat, is that there are two forms of energy that exude from every person. One is an expressive energy. I'm speaking now to you. I'm communicating. Another will call it an intimate energy. It's not something that you express directly. It's far more internal, how you internally process things. And even sometimes something that you yourself can't even describe, it's just how you feel about something. And it's even beyond feeling, often in the superconscious. So it's called the energy, internal energy that is within and the energy without. And essentially that is considered to be the root of two forms of energy that will evolve into masculine and feminine. But let's make this clear. I didn't describe a man and a woman. I described two forms of energy, two archetypal energies. And both need each other. If you were just an expressive person, let's say an extrovert, and you don't have an internal, that's not a complete person. If you're only within and you don't express yourself, it's also not complete. So both are necessary. That's a given. But once you understand that, how does that evolve? That evolves into two types of forces. One is far more physical in a sense and more brute strength. Like you see, a man has, is stronger, physically stronger in almost every instance. Why is that important? Because in the expressive energy, what is necessary? It's necessary to either tame the elements or to interact with the existence around us. And because of that, you need a certain element of strength. Intimate energy is not firepower, it's weaker. But its internal power is far stronger. The power of persuasion, the power of nurturing, the power of, of, a, of an internal intimacy that you don't have in expression. Look even on a sexual level. Very often we say love for a man is a verb. It's an action. And biologically that's the case. For a woman, love is a noun. It's a state of being. Now, which is more powerful? If you're talking about purely an external level, you'll say, one second, the person who's the, the expressive one, the action one, you can see can dominate. And it's true. Men can dominate, unfortunately, and it causes tremendous anguish. And throughout history, the men's ability to sexually dominate a woman. I'm, I'm even going to the worst. I don't even want to mention it, but I will rape and so on. So we see how horrible that can be. But that's because it's a complete distortion of the experience. On the other hand, if it's on a healthy level, the intimate energy of sexuality is far more powerful than it's expressive. It's not just technique. It's not just method. It's not just a physical act. There's a deep connection. Both men and women today especially need to revisit and reclaim true intimacy. But I want to, I want to focus more on the male feminine, the masculine feminine dimension here. So that's, that's, so, so that's an example. The truth is that a healthier world would be if you, we all had intimate energy at the forefront of our minds and our goals in life. But we live in a material world, and the material world, what happens is 
by default, the more powerful, the physically more powerful, dominates. Unfortunately, and I say that explicitly, and that's the story of history. Because living in a material world and losing sight of its intimate, I'll call it even feminine internal energy, causes what? Control, power, where the love of power is stronger than the power of love. And hence, creating this patriarchal society with men, writing the rules and trying to control. So of course, after a while, women will rebel. And that's what they did throughout history, but especially in the last few centuries. Because what's going on here? You know, let's take a basic example, work. Once upon a time, if you look back centuries and centuries ago, I would say even millennia ago, work was considered, a, I don't want to say necessary evil, but it was basically a necessity because there's no choice. You have to work, labor, in order to make a living. But the king princes, the philosopher kings, as they call them, and so on, their goal was not to work. It the, 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 was the more the, the blue-collar workers, the menial labor. And they were philosophizing. And they saw that as an aspiration. Now, whether that's completely healthy is another discussion. But then became a ch things changed, especially in the Calvinistic school of the Protestant work ethic, Work became something part of the divine plan. Now, we'll talk about this in a moment from a biblical point of view. Work as the divine plan. So now, work ethically, be charitable, be virtuous. The birth of capitalism, with some form of heart and soul to keep it not completely aggressive and selfish. Of course, Marx challenged that in his Marxism and Socialism, but yet... Capitalism still dominates as being the most viable option. As Churchill said, democracy or capitalism is the worst system, but I've never found a better one yet. So this became, work became a center of people's lives. Once upon a time, the home was the center of life. And work, a man went out, yes, he was physically stronger, so he can chop wood at a faster pace than a woman could. He can carry water, he can do other things, work in the field. Women also worked, but a man was able to produce more. So who should be the main worker? But then once work, especially after the Industrial Revolution, became more refined, and you're not just sweating in a sweatshop or on a farm, but through, the, through machines and industrialization, able to achieve things. So suddenly, work became a little more glamorous. And men, instead of just seeing it as hard work and now I'm going home, I cannot wait to come back to my wife and children, saw it as a, the career was born. Women, meanwhile, were left really taking care of their children because the men were always in the workplace. Again, women did work, but predominantly it was men. And women finally said, one second, what's going on here? Where are you? Why aren't you coming home? Isn't this the center of our lives? So, of course, the backlash was, we want to be like you. We want to be equal. Now, what is the problem with what I just said? They justif this definitely justify they want to be equal. But how do you go to be equal instead of going out now that women also go to the workplace and losing sight of the intimate energy? It's to reintroduce the intimacy necessary in life, not just expressive. And what is the intimacy? Just to give the example of building a home. You go out, let's say you build a log cabin. Okay, today we build it out of concrete and, and, and bricks and glass and all the, the different elements we use to build homes. So first you need to have the actual taming of the elements or taming of the environment to create a place where you can build, instead of in, in the wilderness, building a stable civilization. So you have to have all those elements to be able to build a home. But those are means. That would be more masculine type of work. The feminine is once you have a home, what does the home look like? The environment, the vibe, the love, the nurturing. That's where life is defined. Now imagine women are also going to build and the home becomes secondary. The love is secondary. Both for men and women. What you've done is you undermine the whole purpose in the first place. And that is the problem that, that, has, that has evolved. Instead of really going back and saying, let's reclaim the intimacy and then look at materialism as a means to the spiritual. Look at the masculine material part of life as a means toward the spiritual femininity. And again, there's overlap, so please don't look at it as men and women, more as archetypes. That would be the key, the true revolution of feminism. 
And that's why you can easily say the feminist movement has killed feminists, feminism, the feminine personality, the intimate personality. But I wouldn't say it's the feminist movement that killed it. It's the whole patriarchal system and the feminist reaction are all part of the same issue. So though the reaction is coming from a good place, let us have equality instead of inequality and control and abuse and all that comes with a patriarchal dominance, the true response would be, in addition to the equal rights or the equal voting rights or uh, financial equality and other suffrage and other p- p- political and social elements, to really re-embrace what it, what it means to be a woman and what it means to be a man. Because we all need intimacy. Men and women, boys and girls, are both carried nine months in their mother's womb where they're intimately nurtured, completely submerged in the embryonic fluids. All of us, as we're born, need that love. So it's not a masculine thing, it's not a feminine thing. And love is the intimate energy. Do men need love? Of course. And so do women. But what's happened is that, yes, we've shifted to a male approach to love, which is more action-based as opposed to a state of being based. It's more about technique. It's more about doing something. When love is really a state of being, of just being the true self that you're supposed to be. So we're now at the verge of a, I would say, a true feminist revolution. The mystics tell us, and the Hasidic masters elaborate on this, that we are literally at the threshold that after years, thousands of years of male dominance, of a new feminine age. And what does that mean, a feminine age? An age where we actually appreciate the inner. And we see that happening, even technology. I remember when I began writing Toward a Meaningful Life, the publisher told me, remember, she said, remember that today people are comfortable with the invisible because it's everywhere, it's shaping their lives, DNA, cells. Micro, uh, the, the microscopic uh, subatomic particles. Of course, technology. Look at your mo- mo- mobile phone. Look at any technology driven by forces we don't see. People are being comfortable, becoming more comfortable with the invisible. And I thought about it when I wrote the chapter on women and men, actually in Toward a Meaningful Life, I speak about that. The intimacy. People are far more comfortable with that which is within. But we need to speak about it. It resonates when you hear about it. But until you don't hear about it, we are still going to be shaped and programmed by the material conventions that are out there. Because that's how we're trained. Boys and girls are trained a certain way. But we remain fundamentally, we're still going to remain who we are. Even if you don't know it, even if you have developed an identity that's different than your core essence, some place is going to give. And that's why I would argue that a lot of the, dis, the, a lot of the dissonance and the discontent and the anxiety of our times is because we have a dissonance between who you truly are as a man and who you're acting as like a man, who you truly are as a woman and how you're acting as a woman. So what I would strongly suggest, not strongly, I think it's critical, let us reclaim what the true archetype, the feminine archetype is like and the real and the true masculine archetype. And you ask where to begin? Well, I'll begin with a plug for Torah Meaning for Life. Read the chapter on women and men. It's a good place to begin. On our site, MeaningfulLife.com, we have a whole section on this. Begin to study and learn what really is the spiritual and the psycho-spiritual essence that defines and the definition masculine energy and feminine energy and how that has evolved into the human being called the male and the female. Because it's not the other way around. The thing is, we begin the other way around. We look from the outside in. I look in the mirror, here I am, a man. Uh, you know, I grew up, you grow up in, a, you go to school with, with other boys, you play with boys, girls with girls. You know, then there's, of course, when the sexual hormones begin to develop and that interaction. But it's all one big confusing mess because no one ever told us who I am. Who am I as an individual before I interact with someone else? as another individual, even man to man, woman to woman, definitely women and men. So we have one big mess. And therefore, there's no surprise why we have a crisis of intimacy, a crisis of relationships. Ask people, what truly is a relationship? What is love? So you have books and books and books. But the key is to get to the core, and most importantly, the core that speaks to you, that resonates, like music. 
discover what it means, what is the masculine and feminine energy in general and within you. And when you can identify it, yes, a man can identify the feminine and the masculine energy within himself, and a woman can identify it within herself, this is the beginning of true liberation. That is what I would call the men's and women's liberation. The true feminist movement, but I would also call it the true masculine movement, because it's not one against the other. This battle of the sexes, that alone tells you so much, that there's a battle. Okay, so now we have to figure out how do we compromise, both sides compromise. I'm suggesting no, no compromise. We're going to reclaim, we are each going to reclaim who we truly are, and then we become complementary. As the words of the Bible, male and female, as one, connecting with the divine image. Now, there's so much to be said on this topic. It's such an unbelievable, important topic. But I'm, I'm trying to really just set the tone. And the goal, really, would be to create several courses and several different programs which break it down in more detail. But the first step is ask yourself. Here's how you define yourself as a man, as a woman. Make a column on a piece of paper. Then try to find out, is this the accurate definition of what a male is? The accurate definition of what a female is? I don't mean definition based on political or contractual or, uh, or different psychological books, but the true essence of it. And I'm not claiming that I have a monopoly on it. I am quoting from the Bible and from the mystical teachings because it's resonated for me. I have done the comparison myself. So in the chapter on women and men in Toward a Meaningful Life is a great place to begin. I'm sure there's other material, and, and, and if it doesn't exist, we should create it. But the first step is to come to identify that. And then something interesting will happen. You'll want to embrace your true personality, not on someone else's terms. And when we do that, that's not a negation of the equality that has been achieved. But like I've spoken a number of times, I said at the end of the day, as all the rules you can write about sexual harassment at the workplace and even financial inequality, there's still a natural, um, a natural inclination of people to want to have control and power and if they can get away with it. So you can write laws which will definitely be a, a um, deter. It'll be a, uh, what's the word I want to use? A, um, yeah, deterrence for people abusing women or for that matter, women abusing men, there are those maybe rare instances. So it's definitely something we'll protect, but it's a deterrence. It's not really a full solution. A full solution has to come from within. Because men will still look at women a certain way. They may not act on it. And sometimes they will, as we've seen, unfortunately. The Me Too movement recently and so on. Um, but what we want is a fundamental change that a man should look at himself and, and the woman in a different way a real revolution of intimacy, a new reclaiming its true, its true definitions. And then when we do that, we can actually change our whole society. So in addition to whatever has been done, not saying replace it, but don't think that is the beginning and end of it all. That's on a basic level. You definitely want to create it, just like when you deal with, let's say, crime, or any crime, any abuse. You definitely need defense. You definitely need... Um, all kinds of forms of ways of eradicating any form of abuse. But that's the defensive part, and we must put that in place. But what you want really is more of a, a being on the offense, not just fighting the negative, but embracing the positive. So you should preempt and prevent crimes like this in the future. A re-education. So we're not just saying, okay, let's put in all the burglar alarms and all the different red flags that protect us, and red alerts, but rather also one where we learn how to embrace it in a very positive way. That is the addition that is critical in this whole revolution. And we can, no question. I've seen it in my own life. I've seen it with people who have embraced that, have developed tremendously beautiful relationships in ways that there is, yes, differences, but a harmony within the diversity between the male and the female. So I hope this, I guess it was the word jogs and shakes something up within you to begin to think about this in a new way and pursue it further. And I would love to hear feedback and comments and thoughts. 
And I definitely, it's a topic which I think needs to be spoken about much more extensively in many different circles. So maybe we can get the conversation going. Share it with others. Let's create a ripple effect. And let's demand a far higher standard in understanding and experiencing ourselves, both as women and as men. And create the true feminist revolution. The true feminist revolution of embracing our femininity while also having total equality with the masculine department and the way that we each complement each other because we all each appreciate each other. Thank you so much. Everyone be well. Simon Jacobson, MeaningfulLife.com, where you can find this program and many other programs and a schedule, a full array of offerings for different top, on different topics for different audiences. Be blessed. Thank you. This program is brought to you by the Meaningful Life Center. Please help us continue our programs. Make even a small contribution at MeaningfulLife.com donate.